Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, University Honors College Lecture Series on Global Engagement. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Um, we have special guests with us today. Um, we have a group of prospective students from Cleveland State Community College, and uh, we're really glad that they're here, and uh, we're, we're glad to have them in our class. I'd like to point out uh, to those of you unfamiliar with the lecture series that in addition to this being an event that is free and open to the public, it's also a, a one-hour class, one of the requirements to graduate from the University Honors College. So this is a, a one-hour class. It, it may be taken up to three times for credit. Uh, so the other thing about the class is that it is the only honors class that's this large, that's even close to being this large, because all of our, all of our lower division classes are capped at 20 students, and our upper division classes are capped at 15 students. So um, this is the only class that is this big. We have about 45 people enrolled in the class today, and we have about 20 uh, prospective students visiting us, uh, as well as uh, staff members and professors and uh, people who are just interested in the topic. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker. Uh, Dr. Laura White is Associate Professor of English here at MTSU. She's also affiliate faculty with the Women's and Gender Studies Program and the Africana Studies Program, and she teaches courses regularly for them. Her research exploring environmental issues in Anglophone literature has appeared in various journals and edited collections. She's currently at work on a book project entitled Ecto Echospectrality, Haunting and Environmental Justice in Contemporary Anglophone Fiction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. White. Thank you very much. And I want to start off first by thanking Dr. Phillips for extending the invitation for me to be here today. I'm really excited to be here with you to talk with you a little bit about my research and to hopefully hear a little bit about the connections it might have to the things you're studying in some of your courses and some of the conversations you've had with your other speakers. So I am going to get started. and. I'm going to let you know that I get really excited talking about English literature, so I, um, I will try to make sure I don't start talking too quickly. And also, most of my classes are very interactive and discussion-based, so I'm also going to move around and, and invite you to share your ideas at different points as well, um, making sure that we save some time for questions at the end so that you can tell me a little bit about, like I said, how what we're talking about today might intersect with some of the things that you've been thinking about and studying about as you've been talking about global engagement. So my talk today, Haunted Borders, Ghosts and Global Connections in Contemporary Anglophone Literature, I thought is also well-timed as we're approaching Halloween. It's a good time to think about ghosts and hauntings. But I'm also hoping that today I'm going to spark some different ways of thinking about ghosts for you. So that in addition to being things that spark some terror and excitement when you're watching scary movies, I'm going to suggest that ghosts can provide ways of thinking about community in different ways and thinking about our responsibility in different ways that cross borders of space and time. So that's, that's the sort of, of hope of, of where I'm going with things today. And my plan is to talk a little bit first about what Anglophone literature is. I know that many of you are not English majors, and even within English studies, Anglophone literature isn't always clearly um, understood. So I want to talk first a little bit about what Anglophone literature is and what its place is in English studies. I want to tell you a little bit about why I've been drawn to study ghosts and what I think we can learn from ghosts, some of the other scholars whose work about ghosts and haunting has inspired me, and then bring it all together by thinking particularly about how ghosts challenge borders and make global, global connections tangible, meaningful, in a particular book. And for today, I chose to look at Michelle Cliff's No Telephone to Heaven. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but I'll fill you in as we go. So first of all, thinking about Anglophone literature and thinking about English as a medium for global connection. One of the writers that I've studied in other contexts is named Amitav Ghosh. And this can also be a cool way for you to, to start a reading list if you're looking for global literature to read. Amitav Ghosh is a novelist who's written a bunch of interesting novels, The Calcutta Chromosome, The Hungry Tide, The Sea of Poppies. Um, so he's an Indian writer who writes in the English language. And he's also written some nonfiction pieces where he talks about how he came to write in the English language and the, the figures who influenced him. 
Um, one of the things that he notes is that in his family home, there were bookcases that were filled with works of literature, and only a small percentage of those were written in the local Indian language, in Bengali in his case. The rest of the books were written in English. And he also points out that not all of those books that were written in English were written by British authors, that English was a medium of translation for him, so that English allowed him to read great works of literature by Russian authors, by Italian authors, by German authors. As a boy growing up in India, why do you think it was that English allowed him to read these different books? Why was English a language that he had access to? Uh, India was a British colony. Yes, so India was a British colony. And so when we talk about Anglophone literature, we're talking not just about English as a global language of translation, but Anglophone literature is usually used to talk about writing in English language in places outside of America and Britain, and usually as a result of British colonization. So I'm going to move on from this idea of English as a global language to look specifically at English as a colonial heritage, about how English came to play a part in people's life because of British imperialism. And there are a variety of different artists who have wound up choosing to write in English as a result of this colonial heritage. And there are very different experiences of colonialism. There are very different experiences of writers, so writers who take very different positions on how they feel about using the English language as their medium. Chinua Achebe is somebody whose perspective I just chose to share with you. He wrote Things Fall Apart, and he might be one of the most well-known Anglophone writers. He is from Nigeria, which was colonized by Britain, and English became part of his heritage. He wrote an essay where he was thinking about African literature and what makes African literature. Does it have to be written in English in, in African languages? Or can it be still considered African literature if it's written in the English language? And in this essay, he thinks about what it means for an African writer to write in the English language. And he makes a distinction. Can an African ever learn English well enough to be able to use it effectively in creative writing? Certainly, yes. If, on the other hand, you ask, can he ever learn to use it like a native speaker? I should say, I hope not. It is neither necessary nor desirable for him to be able to do so. The price a world language must be prepared to pay is submission to different kinds of uses. So his idea is that English is part of his heritage. He grew up learning English, and he has every right to use it. But the English that he uses is going to be different than the, the English that a British writer uses. It's going to be different than a writer from a different British colony would use. And he is defending that, and he's pointing out the benefits of that. Elsewhere in the essay, he gives an example of another African writer who he met who handed him a story and was very excited. He wanted him to read this story. He wanted him to share the art with him. And Achebe said, it was written in Swahili, and I don't speak Swahili. So that English for Achebe allowed him to read the work of other writers and also to share his work with people around the globe. So he defends the use of the English language, even though it comes along with part of a colonial heritage. Other writers take very different points of view. Uh, another African writer, Nguji Wa Kyongo, he says that writing in English is part of the continuing mental colonization of African writers. And he has come up with a different kind of solution, where he has decided to write his novels first in his native language of Gukuyu. And then because he also speaks English, he translates those works into English to share them with people from other cultures. So he's found for him a balance that works is to fortify both the local culture and the local language, and then also to be able to share his works with a global audience through using English. I want to share with you one more writer's perspective, and that's Michelle Cliffs, because she's the novelist who we're going to look at in depth in a little bit. In addition to her novels, she's also written nonfiction, and she's also thought specifically about what it means for her to write in the English language, what it means for her to be an Anglophone writer. Um, the first quote can show you that she has felt a pressure that there's a certain kind of English that you have to speak, that as an artist, you have to use English in a very particular kind of way for it to be considered good enough. So that idea that there's a, a form in which English is meant to be used and meant to be expressed put a certain kind of pressure on her. Because if you didn't use English correctly, 
then what you did was not literature, it was not art. And she talks about in the essay, it might be considered folklore or local color, but it's not considered literature. It's not considered art if you're not using English in the same way that a British person would use English. In the second quotation, though, she challenges that idea. And she says that for her, to write as a Caribbean woman means writing in English, but it also means drawing on other parts of her heritage. So drawing on African oral storytelling tradition, drawing on local uh, rhythms of language, and using English in a different kind of way. So like Achebe, this idea that it's still English, but it's, it's, changing, it's changing English to suit the local circumstances. And it also can be used to challenge the oppression that goes along with colonialism. And so that's where I want to go next in thinking about how writers, she says, writers can use the forms taught us by the oppressor, undermining his language, co-opting his style, and turning it to our purposes. So she gives us this idea that writers can use the English language and can use English forms like the novel to challenge some of the very ideas that supported colonialism in the first place. And so that's where I'm going to start to move now into ways of thinking about the world and, and starting to move to where ghosts are going to come into our story. So I want to talk first about binaries. One of the things that the English language and the novel form conveys with it is a particular way of thinking about the world. And in Western thought, binaries have been really important. When we're talking about binaries, what's a binary? Ideas? What does binary mean when you hear the word binary? No brave volunteers? Okay, it means two. It means a pairing. It means an opposition. And usually when things are defined in binary terms, the opposition is also a hierarchy. One of the sides of the binary pair is privileged over the other side of the binary pair, and it maintains its power by enforcing that separation. So often we see in binaries in pairs, in twos, and we see them divided by that slash line. So some of the important binaries that have influenced Western thought are listed up there. So white and black, civilized savage, mind, body, that slash, that dividing line, is a kind of border that's set up between the pairs, between these opposites. And it prevents us, as critics of binaries start to draw to our attention, it prevents us from thinking about the things that exist in between. So in, in between white and black, there are a whole lot of shades of gray, right? In between mind and body, a lot of our experiences of humans don't happen just as minds or just as bodies. They happen in interactions between the mind and the body. So one of the things that critics of, of binaries come from the Western tradition, but critics of binaries also come from Anglophone writers who start to criticize binaries as part of the logic that allowed for colonization. So being assigned to that subordinate side of the binary is one of the, it participates in the justification for colonialism. Does that make sense for everybody? And so then the Anglophone writers are using their novels to call some of these ideas into question. In Michelle Cliff's novel, No Telephone to Heaven, she is definitely doing this. She's definitely calling binary categories, binary divisions into question. She has a main character who's named Claire Savage. We talked about civilized and savage as a binary. She's not very subtle with her naming throughout the novel. She's using that to draw things to our attention. So she has a main character who is from Jamaica, and she moves with her family to the United States, where her father is very keen to assimilate into white American culture, and he can do that because of the color of his skin. Her mother cannot, and her mother chooses to go back to Jamaica. She is searching for a relationship with her mother and, and sort of a lost mother figure, and instead goes to Mother England to study um, to pursue her college work, and then she travels around in Europe before she comes back to Jamaica. So a lot of literary scholars who have studied this novel have called attention to the way that Michelle Cliff is crossing borders and the way that she's challenging binaries in construction of identity by having a character who doesn't quite fit in one geographic space, by having a character who doesn't really fit in the binary categories. She's between black and white. So there are some really great scholarship that thinks about that, that set of issues in the novel, but I suggest that there are also really important things that are being left out of the conversation because people aren't paying attention to the ghosts. So there are a lot of ghosts in the novel as well as language of haunting and conjuring, 
And that's what I call attention to in my interpretation of the novel. And that's what I think can help to push us in our thinking about the binaries as well. So ghosts can help us to break down binaries because they circulate across borders of time and space. So we have these categories that are set up that are supposed to be opposites, that you have to be in one category or the other category. But when ghosts show up, they sort of dissolve the, the borders. They dissolve those categories. So in terms of thinking about the past, the present, and the future, we have these categories that are neatly divided. And the past is supposed to be behind us. The future is in front of us. They're set in these opposite directions. They're neatly sectioned off from one another. But when ghosts show up, they move among all of the categories. They can't be assigned just to one or the other. Ghosts can show up outside of geographic boundaries that they can be from one place and show up in another place. And by moving across these physical and temporal borders, they start to, to challenge us to think about those binary categories. They start to get us to rethink the opposition between things like presence and absence, life and death, visible and invisible, because they're both at the same time and they're also neither one, so that they don't neatly fit into those categories. Everybody with me so far? So in terms of my thinking about ghosts, I have been inspired by some scholars who have thought about the, the way that if we start to think about ghosts breaking down categories, that pushes us to think about issues of justice in different kinds of ways. It, it, as I said before, by thinking about community in different ways and thinking about responsibility in different ways. So Derrida is one scholar who has influenced my thinking about ghosts and justice. And one of the things that he calls attention to is that justice, he says, really can't be possible or can't be thinkable if we only include what's visible, what's present, what's right here in front of us. If we're thinking about justice, we've got to think across some of those categories. We have to think about responsibility extending to the ghosts of those who are not yet born or who are already dead. So again, that, that thinking about time in ways that it's not just the present compartmentalized, that justice also would involve including the past and including the future, but not just in abstract ways, that ghosts can make the past and the future meaningfully present. So that instead of just an abstract, think about the consequences of your actions into the future, the ghost shows up and the ghost puts demands on you that make you feel that connection with the past and with the future. Avery Gordon is a sociologist who builds on Derrida's work and, and thinks even more about issues of justice. A lot of her work fo focuses on the past of slavery and how that's not something that's just done and over and in the past, but something that continues to show up and to haunt us and to demand different kinds of action, to, to demand different kinds of response. And one of the things that I think is, is the sort of most exciting about her work is the way that she distinguishes haunting from trauma. So both have to do with violences that have happened in the past, but trauma kind of, kind of sits with the injury, the, the damage that has been done by the violence in the past. And haunting, the way that other people have thought about it, can seem similar. If, you are, if you're experiencing a haunting and the goal is to exorcise it, to make it be quiet, to keep it in the past, that's very different, I think, than the way that she's thinking about haunting. The way that she's thinking about haunting is that the ghosts lead us, lead us into relationship, that they have things that we can learn from them, that they have demands that they're going to place on us, and that that can produce us something to be done. So it's not just about the past staying in the past. It's about the past showing us that the future, in another section of the book, she says that it is possible to imagine it and to make it otherwise, so that there's this sense of a, a call to action that haunting is performing. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I see this working in a particular book. So um, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, I am working on a bigger book project where I'm thinking about this idea in relationship to a bunch of different texts and a bunch of different sort of sub-issues. But today I want to focus on how this might work in one particular case and one particular experience of haunting. So in the novel, No Telephone to Heaven, um, it starts off with Claire riding in the back of a truck with a bunch of people who are 
armed and sort of geared up for some sort of fight. And this happens sort of out of the blue. We're not given information really about who she is or why she's there. And flashbacks fill in for us a sense of how she got to this moment. So it's not until later in the novel that we learn about her relationship with Bobby, who's a man that she falls in love with in Europe. He's an African-American soldier of the Vietnam War who's recovering from his past experiences in Europe when she meets him. But when she is back home in Jamaica, she's riding in this truck and she thinks about Bobby. And I want to pay close attention to the language that the narrator uses. Should Claire think of Bobby now at this remove of space and time? Should she ponder him at all, their life together as she moved away from Akampong into High Ruinet? She might conjure him as she had conjured him before. So I think there's something important going on there, something that Michelle Cliff is asking us to think about in terms of what it means to conjure. So she starts off with this, maybe she would think about him, she would ponder. And thinking and pondering suggest a kind of mental activity, a, a, a drawing up the idea of their past relationship, maybe a memory of their past relationship. But conjuring suggests something slightly different. She might conjure him as she had conjured him before. Conjuring means this calling up of his spirit, of bringing him into existence, bringing him into presence in this place. Um, and so there are more, more examples of literal ghosts and hauntings that she's talking about. So this language of conjuring, I think she's using deliberately to get us thinking about the difference between just thinking about a past memory and bringing it powerfully into presence, having Bobby show up in this particular place. And I think the place is important. We said that ghosts cross time borders. And at this point in time, she hasn't seen Bobby. She does not know um, they separated in Europe. And she does not know if he is literally alive or dead at this point. But there is this possibility that she could bring him into this specific place where she is in this back of, of the truck. And there's some language here that I also want to unpack. Akampong and High Ruinet are specific places. Um, so Ruinet is a term that Michelle Cliff explains the she gives the section of her book the title of Ruin It, and then she cites some sources that define for us what Ruin It is. It's a particular kind of landscape. It's landscape that used to be farmland, that used to be human-controlled agricultural land, but that now is going back into wilderness. So that she's in this space that's this kind of in-between space, this space that used to be under human control and is now going back to wilderness. And Akampong is also a very specific place. And so I have this map of Jamaica. And as we're talking about borders, um, we have the borders of something that's called the cockpit country. And so this is a rough sense of, of where the cockpit country would be located in Jamaica. And its borders are also something that are a little vague and, and under dispute. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this particular place. So she's near this town of Akampong, which is a place in Jamaica, in that area of the mountains of the cockpit country. And the cockpit country has a very particular history in Jamaica. And that's where we're going to go next. The cockpit country is haunted in all sorts of different ways. So again, this is not just a random place that she's using to conjure up ghosts. Um, in the novel, the cockpit country is haunted by Jamaica's colonial history. <coughs> So the cockpit country is uh, named for its specific geological features. It has limestone that has been worked through by water. So there are these big pits, cockpits. Um, and part of the history of human habitation and encounters with the land goes back to the colonial history of Jamaica into the 16 and 1700s, where first the Spanish and then British colonists were bringing slaves. And there were slaves who ran away from the plantations and used the cockpits, used the treacherousness of the landscape as protection from uh, slave masters hunting them down and returning them to slavery. They actually were able to form a free community and make a treaty with the British. And some of their leaders, um, including Nanny, become inspirations for the people in the present. So the group of armed rebels that um, Claire is with are casting themselves in the lineage of Nanny. They're, they're saying that they are her sort of children and that they want to see themselves in relationship to her. So this particular story of the past of Jamaica is, is showing up in the background of, of Cliff's story in all sorts of different ways with those references to Nanny, so that that past becomes present for Claire. <laughs> 
It's also haunted in this very personal way. I said that she, Claire left Jamaica with her family and her mother chose to, to leave her in New York and return to Jamaica. She felt such close ties to the land of Jamaica. And so part of Claire returning to Jamaica is coming to terms with her mother and her grandmother and burying her mother, um, dealing with her mother's death. And so there are very interesting ways in which Cliff uses this sense of the land being haunted by her mother. There is a scene where she literally crawls under the house that her mother used to live in and finds her mother's things buried there. So that sense of the, the past being buried in the landscape is something that is, is sort of the, on the bigger historical level with Nanny, but also on the very personal level with her family. Because of this past um, and some additional issues that we're going to get into, this, this specific landscape is a battleground. So the, the land is being fought over in the novel. The armed group, we find out, is planning an attack on a film set where American filmmakers are retelling a story about Jamaica that it turns out the novel makes clear they don't really understand the past of Jamaica, and they hold Jamaicans in contempt. There's a character who says Jamaicans will do anything for a dollar. Um, so that it's setting up this sense, this sense of continuing relationships of colonization and exploitation through the American filmmakers. And also in the background, when Claire is getting ready to join this rebel group, one of the one of the members of the group is interrogating her about why she wants to join and, and what she is, what her understanding of history of the land is. And they wind up talking about the bauxite mining that's going on in Jamaica. So I have, um, on this side is a picture of the cockpit country, and in the middle is a picture of the open pit mining that is part of the, also the history of the land. And in the 1950s, it was, three major American corporations that came to Jamaica to start mining for bauxite, which is a major ingredient in aluminum. And the open pit mining techniques meant basically clear cutting the land, digging out the, all the minerals that they could get. And in the book and outside of the book, environmental activists are chronicling the way that that has long-term effects. So that they come and they mine for a short amount of time, but they are left with polluted waters, polluted air, acid rain, and land that is not fit for agricultural production anymore. So that in the book, that's part of what they are fighting for. But outside of the book, um, there was a petition that just ended last month where um, environmental activists were trying to use the stories of the past of the land to say this is an area where we should not have bauxite mining. So it's something that is that Cliff was drawing into the book when she wrote it in 1987, but it's something that also has extended into our current time. OK, now, if this isn't complicated enough already, we're going to add another layer in here. Because in this, in this space that is haunted that Claire is bringing Bobby to, Bobby's also bringing his memories and his connections to other landscapes. And it works both ways. When Bobby was trying to explain his past to Claire, she needed to draw on her past memories to understand his experiences. So I said he was an African-American soldier who served in the Vietnam War. And when she meets Bobby, one of the things that she's drawn to is the fact that he has this clearly open, unhealed wound on his leg, and that this is kind of a manifestation of, of the wounds of his past that won't heal as well. But the wound is part of the way that his body has been poisoned by his contact with Agent Orange. He doesn't want to talk about his past very much. And when Claire forces the issue and makes him talk about the past, he casts the terrain for her. She couldn't picture it. A country with burns across his surface. Not like a desert, no, not at all, he said. A thick green landscape, stripped by the chemical held in the striped drum, which he had worn in a tank strapped to his back. So he told her. She couldn't envision it, not clearly, but she did remember the bleeding landscape near Fern Gully, rusted, orange, where the ore had been scraped from the country. So he's trying to explain to her the image and the impact that Agent Orange had on the landscape of Vietnam, but his words can't make that happen for her. She can't picture it. She can't understand it. And so she calls up first her memory of what she herself encountered in Jamaica, 
and we see Cliff drawing the, the landscapes together, bringing them into contact. And then the language also sort of shifts in that last sentence, emerging from the dark of the green cave, arced by primeval growth, emerging from the break to find machines at work, stripping bauxite from the country. She's gone from just thinking about it again, just remembering it, to sort of occupying that landscape, being in that space and bringing it with her and putting those two things together. So again, I think this is something that Cliff is doing deliberately to say that these two things are not isolated. At first, if somebody just said, what do Agent Orange in Vietnam and bauxite mining in Jamaica have to do with one another? The connection would not necessarily be clear, but she's bringing these things together and asking us to think about the logic that is enabling these things in both places and the ways that the effects in both places are felt by the people so that it becomes not just a specific local incidence, but something where we see the larger ramifications, the larger connections, the way that the consequences move across borders of countries and borders of time. So a couple more things I want to point out. The toxins themselves work as a kind of haunting. The toxins work across borders and work across generations. So Bobby expresses this really powerfully when he realizes Ever seen that movie, The Incredible Shrinking Man, where the dude gets covered by fine mist? Think of that, it entered me. So we might think of our body as something very clear cut, very bordered, we have clear boundaries, our skin is a boundary, a border with the rest of the world. But he's saying for him, this experience called into question that very personal, very, very sort of clear border, that the skin is not, in fact, a border, the skin is permeable. So what seemed to be separate, his body and the landscape, actually have come together. The, the landscape, the chemical has entered his body, and it's not something that he can just leave behind. So it's not just a memory, it's something that he's carrying with him in his body. The language that Cliff uses to describe the dust from the mines in Jamaica is another way that she draws these two separate things close together. People from miles around are covered by a fine dust which invades them. So she's calling attention again to the experience of these people who are infiltrated by their environment. The, the separation of self from the environment is breaking down for them. And so I'm asking you to think about that in terms of connection to haunting and also to how if we think about toxins in connection to haunting, it takes us back to this idea of expanding our notions of community, expanding our, our, our sense of who we owe responsibility to. Because part of what Bobby is also pointing out, um, it entered me, it doesn't end with me, I don't think you need my nightmare made flesh, that's all. Claire becomes pregnant with his child and he's afraid that this is something that has not just invaded his body, that is also going to pass on to his child. And that is, unfortunately, one of the, one of the notable side effects of Agent Orange is that it passes down to generations, it causes birth defects. So that, that's a, a sort of visible way of passing passing um, this legacy on to another generation that he does not want to be part of. And so the last major thing that I'm going to suggest is that Cliff draws attention to these ghosts, draws attention to these movements across borders to give us a different way of thinking about what can be done, to give us a different way of thinking about the future as well. So that the future is not just set by the past. Um, and generations are not just biological generations. They're not just your physical children. So as a result of this uh, miscarriage that she has with Bobby's child, she is not able to bear children. So she can't, she wants to be a mother. She can't have biological children. And instead, she goes back to Jamaica and she becomes a teacher of history and a very particular kind of history. So she tells us, um, again, when she's being interrogated by the rebel group, they want to know about her principles. They want to know about her experiences. And she says, I've educated myself since my return, spoken with the old people, leafed through the archives, studied the petroglyphs hidden in the bush, listened to the stories about Nanny, and taken them to heart. I've seen the flock of white birds fly out at sunset from Nanny Town. Duppies, the old people say. And duppies are ghosts or spirits. So in this case, she's explaining that for her, History isn't just buried in archives and books, it's speaking to people, it's stories, it's the petroglyphs, it is, she talks about um, 
artifacts that are speaking to her, telling her their stories, and it's these ghosts as well. So all of these are part of the past that she is passing down to children as her legacy. So instead of having biological children, she's talking to the ghosts of the past, and she's teaching children to listen to the ghosts of the past, to expand their sense of community, to include voices from books, but to include voices from ghosts as well. And then how this works out in terms of thinking about time. In a lot of cases, realist novels start with the character's birth. We have their growth, their development. And then if it's a happy story, what happens at the end? They get married and they live happily ever after. And if it is a tragic story, what happens? They die. Everybody dies, and that's the end of that. It's tied to a specific biological lifespan, one human lifespan. And that's our sense of, of time, of, of past, present, future, is tied to that human life. So by adding ghosts, we're also expanding the time frame and thinking about the time frame in a very different way. So at the end of Cliff's novel, it's unclear again what exactly happens to her. Shots ring out, and then she remembers language. Then that space is not an error. That's the way it's set up in the book. Then it was gone. And then we slip into language that, to me, reminds me of bird song and reminds me of her talking about the birds being connected to ghosts. So that instead of her death being the end of the story, day breaks. It's the start of something new. It's the start of listening to the voices of ghosts the start of listening to voices of beyond those who are just physically present. So that is how I think thinking about ghosts can get us thinking about binaries, borders, and time in really different ways in the novel. Beyond just the personal identity of Claire, it can get us thinking about movement across borders of nation, movement across borders of time, movement across even borders of species, and that makes us think about connections in this more global way. So that the bauxite mining in Jamaica is not just a local issue that only affects your biological children. It's put in this larger span of connections. So it helps to make, if we listen to ghosts, we help to see movement across borders of nation and generation. They get included in our sense of responsibility, who we owe consideration to, because they're present. They're here with us. They're not just some abstract idea. And it also, I think, leads to some interesting thinking about the future. In environmental campaigns, the child is usually the figure of what matters for the future. Protect the earth for your child. Do this because your children are going to be affected. If we think not just biologically, not just locally, about children, but if we think about ghosts, if we think about all those spirits who have passed, all those spirits or life that are yet to come, all those spirits that are not just human lives, it really expands the possibilities for thinking about the future. So that is where my work is going. Um, I have for you just the credits of the text that I cited and the images that I used here as well. And I would be really thrilled to talk with you about your questions, your ideas, in response to this work that I'm doing. What originally got you thinking about this? Like, what was the first uh, aha moment, maybe? <laughs> so I was actually working. Um, I was working with a colleague on a collaborative project where we were thinking about ghosts, and she was working with ghosts in a medieval text, and I was working with ghosts in an Australian text. And so we started thinking about what ghosts could possibly do. And I think it was a question that somebody asked me when we were presenting that work that w was asking about, you know, but aren't ghosts just supposed to be scary? <laughs> and so that that pushed me to think, you know, Yes, that, that that feeling of being unsettled, the appearance of a ghost is not something that we should try to take away the scariness of that, the frighteningness of that, but that it can also be so much more than that. And so I started doing a lot more reading and thinking, um, and that led me into this thinking about trying not to exercise ghosts, but to talk with them to see what they could teach us. There was somebody else? Um. So in religious studies, there's this concept of liminality, where during rites of passage, you exit the um, structures of being one thing into the stage where you're kind of in between the binary, and then you enter the new phase. 
Um, I was just wondering if you've like thought of ghosts in terms of like that kind of in between state and like liminality and how like the social structures kind of fall away. So in terms of of at specific moments of rituals in cultures. Well, um, I guess there's a lot to explain with the liminality, but just like the idea that um, like in this in between phase, like because ghosts are in between like life and like after life, I guess, and so. Um, there's this like breakdown of social structures that happens in like the liminal state um, within rites of passage. So I think like that could be applied to ghosts in the way that they do um, enable a new conceptualization of social justice and stuff. Yeah, and so I think that that idea of of the in between there are. A, a variety of thinkers who think about that that space in, in religious studies. It's also something that people talk about in post-colonial studies in, in terms of occupying spaces between cultures. Because for colonized people, they don't really fit with the image and the standards of the colonizer. But there's also the sense of there's no way to go back to a pure past that hasn't been affected by the colonizer. So they're in this kind of, of space between cultures and not really one or the other. Um, and I think that thinking about the ghost in terms of, of that, that in-between space absolutely opens up possibilities for what the ghost can do that people in the society might not be able to do. So the ghost can break some conventions and, and be in this space where there is a little more freedom than the people in the society. And I think that that absolutely is, is a productive way of thinking about you know, the ways that learning from ghosts could help us to take some of those things back to the society and think about those constructs of you know, well, why are these expectations for people in the society? Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody else have connections to work that you have done? I have a question for you. Um, what can literature teach us about binaries? And um, in specifically, um, a number of students in this class are joining me uh, on a trip to Thailand. And we're reading different literary works and, and uh, we'll encounter the term Orientalism. Um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about the relationship between the, the the two between two terms in, in your list of binaries. So you could expand on that a little bit because we could we could listen to this and think, well, what you're talking about is important in the area of literary studies, but in respect to our our lives, yeah. how are binaries important? So I think absolutely that's a great question in terms of thinking about that connection and, and thinking about larger patterns in, in literature and critiques of, of Western ways of thinking, Western ways of using not just literature, but other kinds of discourse about other places, so anthropological discourses about other places. So there is this idea of defining things against one another. Also a really powerful binary is the idea of self and other. So that a, a key part in how we come to understand ourselves is through differentiating ourselves against other people. And so the idea of Orientalism that Dr. Phillips brought up is something that a scholar named Edward Said talked about. And he talked about how the books that a lot of Europeans created about non-Western places didn't tell us that much about non-Western places, but told us more about the Europeans themselves. So that they were describing things in, in terms of trying to disclaim things that they did not want to be. So that the Indian was lazy because that was supposed to show an opposition to the hard-working British man. Um, so that the sense of binaries, uh, literature can help us to see those things and see those operations in, when authors are either buying into the binaries and, and using binary categories to set apart their characters, or when they are calling those binaries into question, when they're asking us to live with characters who, as you're talking about, fall in these spaces in between that, that don't really fit into one category or another. So I think that literature can help us to see that, but absolutely, I, I think it also plays a part in how we come to understand ourselves and how we relate ourselves to uh, people around us. Um, when you're looking at the ideas between uh, trauma and the ghost, um, so like how can you define that a little bit more for me? Because um, I know when I'm looking into readings of like 
modern day African American literature, it's oftentimes that um, the ghost and the trauma are played together, especially in pieces like Morrison. Yeah. Um, so could you kind of flesh that out a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. And I know it's, it's really difficult. I'm, I'm throwing a lot of things together all at one time and not able to go into depth. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're asking the questions so that we can expand that a little bit. So Avery Gordon, uh, Toni Morrison was one of the writers that she spent some time talking about and thinking about, as well as uh, writers like Luisa Valenzuela, who also um, are, are dealing with traumatic past experiences like slavery and the, the sort of, of vanishing of people um, in, in the case of Valenzuela. Um, and part of the distinction that she's trying to make with hauntings is yes, absolutely, ghosts bring back that past violence. They bring it to presence. And so um, in some of Morrison's work, the, the ghosts bring that unresolved pain of the past to presence and show that people are still, are still dealing with the after effects of slavery, dealing with the consequences of past injustices. But instead of it just being a trauma, of it just dwelling with that pain, that the haunting is also, is also inviting us to do something about that. And, and I think the difference between exorcism and sort of instead, of, instead of, like I talked about my thinking of, instead of making the ghost be quiet and go away, talking to the ghost, letting the ghost teach us and instruct us, making, making us think about what happened in the past, and then showing us that we don't have to do the same things, we can do things otherwise by making the ghosts be part of our community. So it's not a sense of, of haunting is something that we have to overcome and put behind us, but that haunting can be a way of living and coexisting with the past and allowing those, those experiences to continue to shape what we do. Does that help to make sense? I think there was another hand at the same time there. Oh, I was just um, going to ask, uh, back to the binary topic, um, how does that relate to foils in literature where uh, it happens a lot in, Sh in Shakespeare, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, Frankenstein and his monster, it's this opposing character that is all the opposites of the qualities and the character of this to, um, to kind of influence um, your perception of the hero or the main character of the book. So how does binary relate to that? Is kind of the whole idea of a literary foil a part of that? Um, okay, that's a really great and interesting question. So I think foils can definitely relate to it, but I wouldn't put them together. I wouldn't say that they're the same thing. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the literary device of foils, I think you did a good job of, of explaining it for us. That It's the idea of a pairing of characters, where one character is our central character, but then we have another character who's in a similar situation, but deals with it in an opposite way, and so that that difference is part of how the, the main character gets defined through this opposition. So it is that same process of defining yourself through, through opposition to someone else, but um, in some ways it's, it doesn't map exactly onto binaries. So you mentioned some of Shakespeare's foils. So um, in Hamlet, we have characters who foil Hamlet, but it's not just a, it's, it's more of a sense of, of some of his qualities of inaction or or internalization so that it, it might not map onto the, the sort of, of dominating binaries exactly, but I think it's a really interesting way. And in some cases, it would. So in the, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde instance, I think that that's, that's a really interesting way of authors could use that, that device of foiling to, to comment on what characteristics are are sort of socially approved and socially celebrated, and which are the ones that are subordinated. So absolutely, it intersects, but not, not exactly the same thing. Great question, though. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, please join me in thanking our speaker.